Halloween is once again upon us, which means it's time for me to review some more monster movies for you guys. My theme this year is creature features. Those wonderful sci-fi horror movies from the 1950s about giant irradiated monsters or aliens from outer space invading small southwestern towns, it always seems to be. The movie I'm going to review in this video is quite possibly the best of the creature features, and certainly it is the, the best example of what I mean when I say a creature feature. It is the 1954 sci-fi horror classic, Them. Them was released June 19th, 1954. It was directed by Gordon Douglas, who was a prolific studio director, made movies of virtually every genre over a career that lasted more than 40 years. The producer of Them was David Weisbart, who actually started his career as an editor, then became a producer in 1952 and went on to produce several classic films, including Rebel Without a Cause, Love Me Tender, which was the first Elvis Presley movie, and of course, Them. Them stars James Whitmore, who is an actor whose face you will probably recognize, if for no other reason than he looks a lot like Spencer Tracy. Uh, but it's not Spencer Tracy, it's James Whitmore, who is a veteran actor of film and TV. He also appeared in The Asphalt Jungle, Angels in the Outfield, Oklahoma, the original Planet of the Apes, and the classic Twilight Zone episode on Thursday We Leave for Home, among many, many other credits he accumulated throughout his long career. It also stars the great Edmund Gwen, who is a veteran of stage and screen best known for his Oscar-winning role as Kris Kringle in my personal favorite Christmas movie, Miracle on 34th Street, them, as it turned out, was one of his final film roles before his death in 1959. The film also stars Joan Weldon, who was a contract player at Warner Brothers at the time. She went on to work in TV and in the theater for the rest of her career before she retired. And it stars James Arness, who is best known for playing Marshal Matt Dillon on TV's Gunsmoke for 20 years, from 1955 to 1975. Gunsmoke and Marshall Dillon was a job that Arness began a little bit over a year after the release of them, and he would become a, a legendary figure in, in TV as a result of playing Marshall Dillon on The Great Gunsmoke. How do I sum up them for those of you who have not seen it? Um, it's the giant ant movie. Them is the movie about giant ants who have been mutated to gargantuan size as a result of atomic testing in New Mexico in the 1940s. And the movie takes place in 1954, contemporary for its release. And the idea is that within the nine years since the first atomic tests in New Mexico, the ants in the desert have been mutated and developed and grown into gargantuan size. They're between 9 and 12 feet long, these gigantic ants. And as the film opens, the ants have been sort of scouring the desert and occasionally breaking into homes or, or stores and raiding them for sugar and also, as it happens, uh, whenever they feel that they have to, killing people. It's the epitome of a creature feature. It has everything that these sorts of movies uh, typically have. It is the, the prototype for what I'm talking about when I say a creature feature. It has uh, a, a monster that was created by atomic testing. It takes place in the American Southwest. Almost all of these movies take place in some way or another in the American Southwest. Uh, it has a, a, an alliance forged between science and the military to try and contain or eliminate this threat. And it is uh, just, not only is it the, the, the perfect prototype of these kinds of movies, it's maybe the best of these kinds of movies. It's one of the best, if not the best, of the five movies I'm going to be reviewing in this series. It's just outstanding. And like uh, It Came From Outer Space, it deals with some very serious, very relevant themes, especially for the time in which it was released. Uh, it Came From Outer Space dealt very much with some political themes and with some social themes about how humans treat each other or how humans, how human communities regard people who are from outside of their community and our tendency to lash out at those that we don't understand. Them deals with very different themes, but, but uh, just as deep and just as resonant to our human experience. And it feels weird to talk about a giant ant movie in such philosophical, elevated terms. Uh, 
And for the most part, the movie is not the movie is not a pretentious movie. This is every bit a big, goofy, giant ant radioactive monster movie. It doesn't hit you over the head too heavily with the themes, with the philosophy. It's 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 not pretentious in any way, but those themes are there, and they are themes of hubris, human arrogance, uh, the unforeseen consequences of human advancement, atomic paranoia, which was a very big thing in the 1950s. It's a very well-made film. The acting is very strong from all the leads. James Whitmore, James Arness, and Edmund Gwen all do terrific jobs. Uh, Whitmore plays the cop who is one of the two police officers who find the little girl at the beginning and is the first to sort of discover the, uh, the wreckage left in the wake of these giant ants. Uh, James Arness is the FBI agent who is called in to help with the case. He's very no-nonsense and all business, as you would expect from a James Arness character. And Edmund Gwen and uh, Joan Weldon are a father-daughter team of scientists who are brought in from the Department of Agriculture, and they're sort of the resident ant experts, and especially the Edmund Gwen character is the, the guy who is always sort of trying to steer the cops and the military in the right direction to make sure that they they are... Uh, you know, spending their resources in the best possible way. He he has a couple of scenes where first he talks them out of bombing the ants, only to talk them into bombing the ants a little bit later, because that would be a more appropriate uh, time to bomb the ants. He's not one of these uh, sort of bleeding heart scientists who doesn't want to destroy the ants because he wants to save them for specimens and he wants to preserve them for science. He is a scientist who is fascinated by them and certainly seems to want to study them, but he also recognizes the gravity of the threat that they pose. There's one really kind of chilling scene where he is explaining the threat of the giant ants to the military in Washington, D.C., and he speculates that if they don't stop these ants now, it could mean the end of the human race within a year. That's some pretty heavy shit. And he's the guy who sort of has to sell that to the military and say, look, you guys have to mobilize, you have to help us stop these things because they're really cool, they're really cool giant ants, but they're going to kill us all in a year if we don't stop them now. They're going to spread colonies all over the world and they're going to kill all of us, so we have to stop them now. Can we stop them now, please? And that's the Edmund Gwen character's uh, motivation and modus operandi in this film. And they all do really, really, really terrific work. Um, it's a well-made movie. The special effects, the giant ants are actually, I, I guess they're puppets. They're, they're, they're actual creatures. They didn't just use blown up, you know, magnified footage of real ants sort of rear projected against human actors. Uh, they're constructed things. They're, they're special effects. They're practical effects, these giant ants. And as with most special effects from movies from this era, they don't really hold up to modern scrutiny. They don't look like real giant ants, whatever those would look like, but they do look good. They do look, they don't look so bad that they take you out of the movie. And it's another one of those movies, again, I think it's perfect for a creature feature like this because it's well made enough, it's competently made to the extent that it, it's not impossible to enjoy it as a movie on its own terms, but it's also goofy enough and silly enough. I mean, the inherent premise of, of radioactive mutated giant ants is silly enough uh, that you can enjoy it on an ironic level as well. You can watch it, you can make fun of it, you can make jokes about it. It's a really, really great movie for that as well. There's a pleasing scope to the film. It begins in the American Southwest, like these movies seem to do typically, but then it moves to Washington DC, and then it moves for its final section to Los Angeles, and the miles and miles of drainage tunnels that exist under the city of Los Angeles. So there's, there's a wonderful sense of changing locations. Uh, the film takes place over a, over a period of months, not a couple of days or a couple of weeks, as our heroes track down where these giant ants have spread to and try to figure out ways to contain them and to destroy them. And there are some really nice uh, moments of comedy in it as well. Even though the very silly premise is always played completely straight, there are some nice moments of levity between the actors. There, there are moments of character comedy, like particularly a scene relatively early in the movie when uh, the main characters have split up and they're in different helicopters uh, searching the uh, New Mexico desert, looking for the first of what turns out to be a series of colonies of these gigantic ants. And uh, the Joan Weldon character and the James Arness character are in one helicopter, and the James Whitmore character and the Edmund Gwen character are in another helicopter. And Edmund Gwen's character wants to call his daughter in the other helicopter, Joan Weldon, 
on the radio, but he doesn't know any of the call signs. He doesn't know any of the protocol. So James Whitmore is sort of coaching him on, okay, here, listen, that's not how you, that's not how you call the other helicopter. You say this. And then when you're done talking, you have to say over. And Edmund Gwen is like, okay, fine, I'll try it. And then, you know, he keeps having to be prompted to say over. And when he's done talking, James Whitmore says, okay, you're done talking. You have to say over and out. And Edmund Gwen is like, why do I have to say that? She, she knows I'm done talking. And it's just, it plays for a really wonderful laugh. Uh, and it's a really wonderful moment to sort of bring out the characters because the movie for the most part is very plot driven. It's not super character driven, uh, but it sticks in those moments of character that provide some comedy and provide some humanity to the people uh, to lend a little bit of extra dimension to what you're seeing. So it's much, much better as a movie than you would expect a giant ant movie from the 1950s to be. But it can also be enjoyed on that very superficial, silly level as just a hugely preposterous, goofy movie about giant mutated ants. It's a really wonderful film. And if you are looking for something fun to watch this Halloween, some wonderful old school sci-fi horror movie, if you're looking for the quintessential creature feature this Halloween to check out, especially if you've never seen it before, I highly recommend that you take an hour and a half out of your day and check out them.